here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is The C86 Show. I'm David Eastor. As you know, we love a special guest. Yes, we do. Um, and this week, we've caught up with Tim Dorney, one-time member of Flowered Up, keyboard player, and now also the uh, one of the founding members of the band Republica, who are still going. So, um, yes, this is it. <laughs> I don't need to give you any more introductions. You get the gist, don't you? Anyway, it's a great interview. Okay, so I'm being slightly biased. But anyway, after several minutes of casual chat to find out about life, love and poetry, we got down to the interesting subject that was the early formative years of Tim. Tim, tell us more. Tell us now. It, came, it basically came from skateboarding. I was an absolute nut for skateboarding in my when I was sort of 14, 15. And was part of a it was part of a youth club, but it was like a little um, sort of social thing that we used to have going on with the with the skateboarding. So we we'd all meet up and go to skate parks at the weekends, and all this sort of just basically fed into music. People started bringing cassettes along to play in the van, and um, it just sort of it just we all sort of woke up to the same sort of music. And at that time, it was for us it was. Ultravox, Gary Newman, um, oh blimey, my daughter's weird. You name it, anything from around that period, we sucked it right up. And from that point, when we got a little bit older, um, I mean, at 15 and 16, I went to like Futurama 2 in Leeds, which had Susan the Banshees, U2, um, Soft Cell were first on the bill on the Saturday. Um, that was all with these skateboarding people. Right. And, um, we went to see Devo at the Rainbow in 1979. We went to the Human League in 1980 at Hammersmith Odeon with the first gig with the girls and all that sort of thing. And that was, but finding Gary Newman's first album on blue vinyl in the local market was the first proper album I bought. Right. And that, and that, that was, was so your, so what were your family like? Were they at all kind of musical? Was there a I, sort of, no, 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 not at all. No, none of them were. My, my father was an engineer through and through. Right. And, uh, my mother is secretary. So, no, I never showed any inkling from it. And But my 16th birthday present was my first synthesizer. Was that the Casio? So, the Casio? Uh, it, well, I had a, I actually, I, I had a Casio, a VL tone just before that. But no, this was a what was called a Tysco S60F. Right. Which is a little single oscillator mono synth. And why, um, key, and why keyboard? Uh because I was useless at guitar and I'd sort of, I've been sort of listening to music and a couple of my friends have pianos in the house and there was a piano at school actually in the hall that I could go and sort of tinkle around on. I'm not very, I'm like, I, I, I knew nothing. It was just, I was trying to play Joy Division songs and things like that on there. But um, no, that was what set me off. And it was just the fact that I could make loads of different noises out of it rather than just sort of try and strum chords. For me, it was it was about the, the impact of the sound. Yes, absolutely. And to a certain extent, I, my, like, my, my technical knowledge of keyboarding is absolutely zilch. I'm terrible. But um, <laughs> I, I just work on the basis of if I like it, someone else might. And luckily to date, that's been quite a good thing to stick to yes so. well absolutely well it's kind of interesting because because i mean you know like i mentioned i was born 64 i had an older brother who was quite into prog rock and i kind of worshipped him at the time when i was growing up and he was you know i was very mesmerized with these albums by you know the solo work of rick wakeman and van gellis yeah. and and patrick Morez, i think his work name is and and tangerine dream so there was all these kind of as well as the usual kind of obvious ones like you know genesis and barkley james harvest but the, the so the, those kind of solo works were quite something and bizarrely my brother bought the an eight track in the late 70s when he went in the the army or whatever and um one of the tapes was the david bowie low album which i think he bought by mistake but i remember we played it a lot and and yeah. obviously side two was a bit mesmerizing really very much so. That's uh, that's the instrumental side, isn't it? It is the instrumental. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's, it's definitely. I mean, I came to a lot. I, I came to appreciate a lot of that later on. I mean, obviously at the time I was, sort of, we were heading into new romantic periods, and there was a, a club near us in Slough that had, like, I mean, there'd be like thirty people. Depeche Mode were playing in front of you, and Soft Cell and Blumange and 
and those sort of things. That was what really, like, the, the, it was the people turning up with a big ghetto blaster at the back of the stage and just playing a couple of keyboards and just getting on with it. That was what really inspired me, I think. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, it, it, it was the almost the punk ethic with the sort of anyone can do it type thing. Well, at the time, I mean, I didn't really go for the the Pesh Mode thing because I'd slightly, I suppose, I sort of labelled them as new romantics, and I thought, yeah. that, and and so I sort of had a, not an issue, but you know, it was like, oh my god, you know, and I'm being a very repressed sort of person. I couldn't imagine dressing up with those frilly clothes and putting an eyeliner up. So, I, I, yeah, I, I I admit to wearing the guy liner, a cavalry shirt, and a neckerchief more than one occasion. Nice, but, uh... that's very good. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm impressed. Yeah. You know. Nothing too. Fl- Flamboyant. Yeah, and as the eighties progressed, because I, I, and that sort of thing, I did. I I came to that later through and appreciate like other people playing it to me further down the line. Once I was a fair bit older, really, it must be said. Yes, and when we, when did you sort of get into your first band? When was the sort of first musical moment came when you were sort of trying to make a sound with some other people? Um, that would have been in the sixth form at school. Um, there was a local band called Wide Noise, who were uh, just a bunch of my friends in in a club. Who um, a guitarist, bassist, drummer, and singer, punk covers, all that sort of thing. And I said, once I'd got this keyboard from the sixteenth, I sort of joined in with them for a bit. But that only lasted about six months because um, everyone went off to university, which I didn't. So it was just that sort of floundered. But um, after that. Um, Basically, in the local pub, I met up with John Mayle, who is my writing partner in Republica. Right. Still, still 40 years later. Well, at least 40 years later, actually. Um, in fact, I was texting with him earlier. So we formed a band called Jennifer, which was uh, at the time had a, another keyboard player called Polly Hancock. And Johnny played guitar and sang. Um for, I think for my 17th birthday, I got a, a Fostex X15 Porter Studio um, and we bought a Yamaha DX9. And basically, we ended up with a like a residency in the local pub. Um, once a month, every Tuesday, we'd put on a gig. Uh, the backing, we'd record, we'd write these songs, we'd record the backing tapes down at the Porter Studio. Um, normally, unfortunately, using the vary speed on it, so it ended up with a load of chimograph marks on it to try and get the backing tapes in tune with what we were trying to play. But um, it was good fun. We like we built up a little bit of a local following. But then mm. Johnny went off to Manchester. Was so that I, university? Yeah, he was. He well, he went to Poly up there actually, studying so, one of these kind and caring sort of. Thing. It was it was a very easy degree, I think. He didn't, yeah. He just he didn't go a lot. From what I can gather, and probably dropped out. I think he deferred in the end because uh, he he started a band up there actually with Jez from Doves. Blimey! And a um, couple of other people. Um, yeah, they were called. Uh, oh, blimey! Uh, they had an EP out called Die Young. I can't remember the name of the band now, but um, yeah, it included Jez from Doves. Right. Who at sixteen was an absolute guitar prodigy at that point, and still is to this day. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so Johnny went off. I didn't do a lot for about a year or so, but um, by that time I was working, so I was acquiring a bit more equipment, sequences, drum machines, and I ended up um, working with a another person that I'd been to school with, which is the chap called uh, Andy Weatherall, who was a, a well-known DJ who unfortunately left us earlier this year. Mm. But um, we ended up doing just again, just with the Porter Studio, doing a couple of little jiggy things. And this is this is prior to Acid House, and this is sort of 80, 85, 86, something like that. Right. Yes, because I can remember because the because because that that period, <laughs> and I suppose because I was very addicted to the whole John Peel show, so I was always putting mm. in my TDK D ninety cassette recording. Oh, oh God, absolutely. Forty minutes an evening because I had always I never listened to it live, but then being very fascinated. I mean, I did you know indie pop was my thing, but I did love all the the Bundu Boys and uh, Gregory Isaacs, and then. 
you know, yeah. he started bringing in that kind of dance world that, that was kind of mesmerising the Chicago house sound. And I remember the, even the NME brought out a vinyl compilate or collect a vinyl record, which I still have a few of them, all, a few of them, which was kind of I suppose early ha acid house, which was quite. They were, yeah. It was very squeaky. I just remember being very. It was. I think it was some a band called Future <laughs> with PH, and um, and desperately yes. wanting to like it, but not sure if I really did. No, I, well, I got into, the, yeah, I did get in. I mean, I went through from the sort of um, the new romantic days. Um, I sort of from that, I went a bit goth. It was Theatre of Hate, The Cure, bit of Susie and carrying on further down the line. It was even a bit of level 42 and just sort of widening the horizons, really. But, but come the, I mean, from about 1986 onwards, I was going to the Mug Club up in London. And we'd, we'd start to get into clubbing, so it was more the sort of hazy fantasy sort of period, that sort of thing. Nice. But Acid House was when we thoroughly embraced it. That was like 1988, going to Shermond and the trip and all <laughs> all that get right on one matey time. <laughs> well, absolutely. Yes, because cause indie, you know, that world that I, I loved of indie pop, it kind of came a bit to an end in 87, which is a sweeping statement. But, you know, the Smiths, the Smiths broke up and then sort of ecstasy appeared and then the next next kind of 16 18 year olds wanted their kind of sound and they didn't really care about the smiths that much and and well, suddenly well, I didn't get to see the smiths though um that was a um glc when when the glc was being dismantled after after red ken when they were putting on loads of gigs around london i got to go to a load of them at the time and the smiths and the redskins i think it was i saw in um in the town hall in London, the big, uh, the big, the old big GLC building there, and that was a fantastic gig. It can't have been long before they disappeared, but it no, was a it was kind of a, it was a kind of a magical moment because I know the Redskins did one album, neither Washington nor Moscow, and it was kind That's of like there. the Clash meets Motown, and I thought it was just a stunning album. The, yeah, mis the mystery is what what happened to the members of the Redskins, especially the lead singer who has completely disappeared. Oh, has he? I don't know. I did see somebody was hung. You know, I don't know if you know Stuart D. Bill. He's uh he writes he does books and stuff on sort of a lot of mods. He's very jam obsessed, but uh, I think he was trying to hunt them down recently as well. But mm. I don't know how far he got down the line. But he was definitely talking about it. Yeah, the mysterious yeah the mysterious Chris. He's just mm -hmm. he's he's never been seen since disappearing from the band and stuff like oh, that. Wow. So yes, it's one of those ones. So did you? I mean, were you kind of because in that period, because there was that whole sort of the Thatcher, the what well, the anti Thatcher world wasn't there, and there was mm -hmm. Red Wedge, yeah, and right. there was there was the whole sort of the you know getting the the kids to vote, which kind of didn't work very well at, no. either. I mean, did were you sort of caught up in that kind of whole political kind of angsty stuff that that so embraced the eighties? I wasn't so I wasn't an activist, so to say. I mean, my politics are definitely more socialist than they are Tory, but um, I wasn't an activist by any stretch of the imagination. And for us at that age, it was just a good excuse to go up to a good gig and watch a load of people. I mean, all the Nelson Mandela stuff they used to put on in Clapham Common we used to always go up to that, and um, it was they were just great days out. That was the thing. And it did. I, I mean, my politics do lean to the left, but um, but no, certainly not an activist in any form of the imagination. I certainly wouldn't be sitting there in a collective espousing women's rights or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you, you'd only put on, you'd only put, I don't know, it would be so easy to say the wrong thing as well. But... It, but no, I'm, I, I don't, I don't nothing... <laughs> Nothing anti-feminist, but it was just not my path. Do you know yes. what I mean? So when when suddenly okay. there were there, there was the sort of a new vaguely new chapter because there was a bit of a North London scene, wasn't there? With like My Bloody Valentine, and there was bands like, I suppose the early years of Lush, but there were Faith Healers and Silver Fish, who were sort of yeah. all part of that squatty scene. But then the ecstasy world had taken kind of you know the indie band of the Soup Dragons went from two minute little kind of thrashy numbers to this epic kind of rave number and then you had the happy mondays who also managed to sort of get a sound that sort of embraced you know the the sort of the times as yeah. well as primal scream so with your did you sort of embrace that kind of new sound and new vibe and then obviously the stone roses here well the thing i i was still very much in the technical dance side of it i mean i was doing remixes with andy weatherall i worked on uh, actually i worked on my bloody valentine the grid um that petrol emotion. Uh, another one that was something to do with the guy out of Blumange. But um, so I was more very much the technical 
the acid house and the remix side of it rather than, but i had an indie an indie grounding having having played with johnny having been into the cure and various other bands throughout the years so yes. i always put in both camps even though i was out slinging my hands in the air and dancing to squelchy three tv 303s at the same time i was going home and listening to bill nelson so things like that were were going on i mean the, the flowered up connection came about again through andy weatherall um they'd been they they had about three songs together i think and their keyboard player had quit and the manager bumped into andy and said i don't suppose you know anybody do you who plays keyboards we're looking for one so um i found myself somewhere in the depths of elephant and castle trying to find a rehearsal studio with a bunch of uh, North London <laughs> ne'er do wells, um, very strangely, in about 1989, 1990. Um, yes, which was which was the the beginning of your an epic journey or chapter. It was, yes, that was that was where it all changed. Yes, because <laughs> just going slightly back, because I remember getting very excited by Adamski's live. Was it live in a direct? Um, co- you know. Co- uh, yeah. First album, and also the Guru Josh, which I thought was quite genius. <laughs> yeah, no, he was, a, a, in fact, a friend of mine ended up working for him many years later in his studio. But uh, yeah. yeah, Guru Josh, I wasn't quite so into, but uh, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Adam, dear old Adam. Yeah, Adam, Adam, I met a few times actually. He was, he was a nice guy because Saffron, as well from Republic, and knows them all from Rave Days because she was in Enjoy. They were going out doing raves with Prodigy, with Adam, with all sorts of people. Yeah, so Saf- I, I've met a lot of those people through Saffron in later years, but um, was never part of that big ravey, ravey, hardcore yeah. type scene. I was more sort of in early and then moved on to the indie dance side of it, really, I think. Yeah, and your your experience have flowered up because cause you sound like you were the musician in the band. Is that true or were there, did the no. other... Far from it. Well, mm, I think I was the producer in the band and didn't really know it. Um, The musician was definitely Joe, the guitarist. He was outstanding and is still the best guitarist I've ever played with by a long chalk. Um, But they needed, everything needed guiding and like we could jam for days and but not get anywhere. I think the difference with me coming in is it that they, they turned more into songs than they did just epic jams because Joe could just noodle for hours. Andy was a massive fan of John Petucci and could play <laughs> ridiculous bass notes forever. And the drummer was just a fan of Pete Moon. So um, it just went round and round in circles, really. With it, it quite possibly went round and round in circles, but I'd be like, no, we've got like one bit. How about mixing it with that bit? And, making a song from these two and combining those two together. Right. So I think that was a strength within it. Um, I mean, Liam was always, uh, I mean, love all, I mean, he's complete marmite on the vocal front. You either get it or you don't. I mean, the closest sort of, I mean, Idols is the, probably the closest example <laughs> of a Liam delivery these days. Yes. And I remember going to one of those Glastonbury festivals, which must have been the early 90s. And Weekender was definitely one of the anthems of that week. You know, that's... 92, that would have been. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. So that was, you know, that was really, you know, something. And there was this whole thing with Heavenly Records and then the big kind of the, the record deal, wasn't it, with London? Because yeah. before that, we'd had that, uh, the poet, hadn't we? Um, not Charles Shell Murray, there was another, the the Million Pound Poet, which was called, oh yeah, Murray Lackman Young, who, who'd sort of got no, a million Murray pounds. Lackman, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> simply everyone's doing cocaine. I think that was one of the biggest ones, wasn't it? It was the one that he, was, he yeah. you know. So, <laughs> so, so the, the so the million pound record deal was quite something. So did you all slightly have a bit of a, my God, have we just been given the million pound? Well, we weren't given a million quid. That was, that was a six album deal and it was spread out. It was a million quid over a six album deal. But at the same time, we also spent 300,000 recording the first album, I think. Or no, yeah, something like 200,000 doing the first, doing the album, which was just insane. It was the blind leading the blind. So, um, yeah, it wasn't <laughs> three months in Eel Pie Studios talking to Pete Townsend every morning, but it was great. But at the end of the day, we didn't, 
what we should have done was just recorded ourselves live and stuck it out and just got a great engineer and record it and mix it. Yes. And then we got our front of house engineer, stuck him in a big studio he knew nothing about, and he really didn't know what the hell he was doing. So <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the management realised the difference between like a producer and an engineer. That was the problem. And the guy they put in, in control of it. He was way out of his depth and he wasn't even a great engineer. So we ended up with a product that was not nowhere near what we should, nowhere near as good as it should have been. Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, did you sort of, did you realize at the time things weren't quite going quite as smoothly as they should have been? Or was it just kind of? Um, it, because of the amount of time it was taking, it was obviously it was getting a bit ridiculous. But unbeknownst to me at the time, they'd also started getting into harder drugs. So there was always a bit of E and a bit of cocaine floating around, but they were going at that point. I found out later they were disappearing down into uh, darker depths, shall we say? Yes, it did sound a it bit making things difficult towards the end of the recording of the album. It really did. And, yeah. I mean, I lived out in Windsor. The studio was in uh, Richmond. And all they had to do was get on a tube from North London, but I'd be there at 11 o'clock in the morning and they'd roll in at five. It was that sort of thing going on. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Were you, I mean, when you, I mean, with the album and when you got to hear it, were you a bit sort of mixed emotions about the sound of it? Um, to be honest, at the time, it was it was just what it was. It, it, we'd done the best we could under the circumstances, I felt, but it could have been so much better. I think we we missed our chance there, really, with that one. It, what we should have done was just set it up, record it in one hit, just real proper old rock and roll style, everybody in the room, eye contact, uh, spillage everywhere, but just mix it and make it sound like the live gigs. I've had, um, uh, in the past couple of years, I've had a lot of bootlegs and stuff, excuse me, start coming my way. And... Um, we were a very tight and very good live band. I'm I'm a bit gutted a lot of the time when it was never recorded off the desk and yes, things like that. And in in that sense, I mean, I draw a line after that after the first album because things did change after that once we got involved with Clive Langer, which was led to us leaving London and going to Sony's and all that sort of thing. Clive was a proper producer, um, still a very good friend, and. Um, just knew what to do with us. He'd done Madness, he'd done Bowie, he'd done Dexys, he'd done, you name it, he's bloody done it. Teardrop explodes, everybody. Yeah. But he knows how to deal with personalities as well, which is something that uh, Nigel, the guy who produced the first album, didn't have the faintest idea of what to do. He was more scared of the band than anything else, I think. <laughs> Did you ever sort of feel there was anything looking back that could have happened to have saved it, or was it just like inevitable it was going to die? Uh, what with flowered up? Y yeah, yeah, it was going to die. It was definitely. I mean, Weekender was amazing, but a struggle. And then after that, it was. Put, we started changing personnel. In fact, the bass player doesn't even play. Um, Andy Jackson, the bass player, never actually played on Weekender. It was the roadie we'd sacked him the week before. <laughs> he won't be happy with me divulging that information. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it was it, um, I, I, it had run its course and people were just disappearing down very dark holes. Um, yes. Trying to, trying to put tours together and people, like even supporting Madness, their first comeback gigs at Finsbury Park, the ones where like it was all over the papers because where people were going that there was an earthquake going on because of the amount of turbo sound PA they put in there. But we played that, but Liam was hiding in the toilet and we went on stage half an hour late, which is just so embarrassing. Yeah. So things like that were going off and it was in the end, it was just I just and nothing was being written. Nothing people like we book a rehearsal, only half the people would turn up. And all this time, they were living in North London, we were rehearsing in North London, and I'm still living out in Windsor, and I really started to get the ump about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you must have... Were you ever feeling like, God, this is our chance, guys, and you're really not taking it? Yeah, very much so, yeah. No, I, oh, there's there's a track that's on the B-side of Weekender called Enough's Enough, 
and uh, actually it didn't get released on the proper release of we it's only on the promos that london put out originally and um it's a b-side that i started writing while we were in doing weekender i had a program in sweet setup as well and it was a song that i was writing there they needed a b-side so i got put into another studio um by this time the drummer and the bassist we got rid of both of them so it's machines and uh, actually joe played guitar and bass on it i programmed all the drums and did all the keyboards but leon came in and just put down the worst vocal i'd ever heard it was just like it just didn't know what it, it was just ranting nonsense so <laughs> once he came out i went into the um <laughs> I went into the vocal booth and did a counter vocal to it, basically just slagging him off completely for turning up with an absolute load of shit. <laughs> and, uh, not playing the game. It's just like you think you're going to get away with that. You've got another thing coming and all this sort of stuff. I did it immediately. Yes, absolutely. We I mean, still, did it? We, we still, we, then we, trained, we got uh, another bass player and a different drummer who were great musicians. Unfortunately, the bass player started going down the route of the other two. And it was sort of me and the drummer were the only two that were sort of holding everything together for a while. Um, the management was sort of trying to put us out on tour to get some money in because we'd spent all the money and this sort of thing. And the deal hadn't ticked over into the next year yet. And it was it was a horrible. I mean, I was coming up and asking the management for, can I have some money, please? Because I've got bills to pay. He's like, oh, we haven't got any this week. The drummer went off and like, spent it all on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Okay. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So it, by the end of it, it by the end of it, I, I was at my wit's end. I just rang him up and said, I can't do this anymore. I've had enough. And I went and dropped, drunk a bottle of Jack Daniels to myself and never looked back, to be honest. But obviously I did in 2005 and 2001 when I worked with Liam again. But um uh, no, at the time at the end of Flowered Up, I was I was I was done and dusty with it. Yeah, that must have been quite something. And, and was it that period of time that you had before you kind of reconnected with members? Uh, yeah, I because I'd gone off and done Republica in the meantime. So we started um, at the end of Flowered Up. I would I went to France with Johnny again. Johnny Mail comes back into my life again. Uh, he has a band called SFS who became Sensation, who put about three albums out on One Little Indian. And we ended up, uh, he, I'd, I'd done a version of Everybody's Got to Learn Sometimes that the Corgis did years ago, and everyone's done a bloody cover version of it now, but <laughs> this is before most of them. And it was, it's on the Sensation album. So I went out, they were recording it in France with Mike Hedges. So I went out for that, and um, I was out there for three or four days recording with them, and Jez was out there again from Doves, and... Uh, we used to have competitions, actually. They, they, Mike Hedges had a big swimming pool out the back, but this is the middle of winter, so it had a big inflatable cover over it and then a cover across the pool. So one day we bet Jez that he couldn't get from one side of the pool to the other across the covering on it without getting his bollocks wet. <laughs> so we all ended up chipping in, like, 10 quid, 20 quid. I think he was up to about 60 quid in the end, and we were, like, were all around the pool one morning as Hedges, the rest of the band. is actually Robin, the drummer from Bush, was in was in that band as well. He was out there at the time as well. So we're like we we there was video of it many years ago of Jez actually crossing the pool and not getting his bollocks wet. Excellent. But the engineer on this session was a guy called Andrew Todd, who um, actually we ended up betting him that he couldn't do it lengthways down the pool, and he put his foot through the cover about two steps in and completely blew it. <laughs> <laughs> he never got the money. But he ended up being, we started working together after that. Um, as Flowered Up was dying, I was starting working with him and he was coming down to my place. We were just going to do dance singles. We were just going to sell them on to people for £500 a time. We were all like duck and dive, club, all clubbing again. Yes. So I started working with him and eventually we um, we ended up with saffron, <laughs> which was quite a move, wasn't it? Because did you were you getting that feeling? I mean, obviously, looking back, it's kind of obvious now. But you know, we had it was the John Major years, but the rise of kind of the Brit pop kind of and and the shiny guitars and the kind of big yeah. anthems. Were you were you thinking? Because obviously, you know, the Happy Mondays were the band that that sort of caught everyone's imagination during that yeah. period. 
And you must have looked at Flowered Up thinking, Christ, guys, we should have done that. And then, and then sort of, not through luck, but through work and perseverance, you sort of formed a band that then sort of also have one of those anthems as well, really. Yeah, that was... Well, the thing was with Flowered Up, it was... It, I always look back at it with... Like, it could have been so much better, but we... It, there was so many different influences and pressures coming from different sides that affected everybody in different ways. Um, in terms of Liam and Joe, it led to addictions. Um, there, there was a lot in their history as well that I didn't know about before I joined that, that sort of reared its ugly head as well. So I think in Flowered Up, we did the best considering the pressures that were on the band, especially from London and people like that, um, to come up with the goods. And I think pe some people just... Will sort of wilted in the in the spotlight of it. Yes, I, I mean Weekender. I mean, I've always said I've had two hits in my life: Weekender for the kudos and and ready to go for the for the global hit that it was. But I, the, they're the two tracks I'm the most proud of. But Weekender is just for me. I, it's I've got to say, it's a there's a lot of my own work in there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it uh, was it was kind of a. Well, it's kind of almost. I remember the Happy Mondays did Hallelujah, didn't they? Which was a kind of epic kind of dance number. Yeah. And um, Weekender was another one of those ones, which you know was thirteen minutes of glory, really. It showed what we were capable of, but we never, we never burned so bright since. Well, that's true. I mean, with yeah. with with the sort of the the murky world that is rock and roll. Do you sort of, in that slightly looking back kind of way, realise if you've come from a slightly, you haven't got the best family background and you have had a bit of ups and downs in life, the worst thing you could do is become a pop star? Um, yeah, I think in, the, in, in terms of those boys, it was in them, regardless of anything they did, they'd have ended up that way. And they had a history of it before, before Flowered Up. But um, no, I think, yeah, I don't know. It, it, perhaps they weren't the best people to be having money thrown at them. Yeah. But, but at the at that same time, it was glut season in the in their English music. Everyone was getting signed. You couldn't put a foot wrong. <laughs> Everyone was getting sixty thousand, hundred thousand, three hundred thousand just for the first signings. It was just like you. Once you were in a deal, you could move from deal to deal without any problem. If you had a little bit of history, they were willing to throw loads of money at you then. Yes. Well, that was interesting Which looking at that. Ultimately destroyed it as an industry. I mean, you think of anything. If you look at it as R&D, no industry spends 70% of their income on, on R&D, which is what essentially they were doing in the 90s. I mean, gay dad, how much did they get? <laughs> Well, it's funny you mentioned Gay Dad because I was looking at that book and thinking of uh, Northern Uproar and Menswear. Yeah. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, God, bloody, they're all in there, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was always great fun, actually. And I still see Jeff to these days. We're still in contact. And uh, uh, Heavenly was always, a, uh, he loves music, that guy, I tell you. It's unbelievable. Yes. But they did also sort of sign some pretty bands that you would have thought not the greatest bands as well yeah yeah sly and love child uh, <laughs> <laughs> i can think of quite a few others as well yeah, yeah it wasn't a, like a roster that you thought wow you know there was a lot like mm, okay that's um it's a bit like alex <laughs> ferguson for man united he was he wasn't ever great well he was occasionally but he did sign some really bad players when he had a lot of money where he was better yeah. he was better developing players who were young and sort of getting them through that way than saying, look, here's 70, oh, I don't know, 30,000 going by a player. And it's often, it just never really worked out. So I did notice that, that heaven, the heavenly roster was was kind of filled with some... There's yeah. some interesting ones in there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and I also quite random. I think was on the piss with, actually, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah. So with, with Republica, did it feel that things clicked quite quickly, especially after you got Saffron in the band? Well, we'd, um, we basically got signed on the first track we did. Um, me and Toddy, we did a couple of remixes for people and stuff, and we were pulling in a bit of work with other people. But we were trying to concentrate on this thing that wasn't called Republica at that time. Um, 
but Saffron was a friend of a friend of ours who um, worked at a tape duplication plant in um, Fulham. So she put us in contact with Saffron, who'd come out. She, she'd done Enjoy. She'd had a solo deal with Warners, and then she was looking for something else to do. We had an instrumental backing track, just the first thing that we'd done. So we just passed it on and see if she was interested, which she was, came down. Uh, came down to BMG Studios where we were doing freelance engineering work to make some money and uh, and did the first single and we got signed to Deconstruction on the first single so it was so they did a, a, a quick one single deal for that and then we started playing them other stuff and we ended up with an album deal and then sort of two years down and they left us alone the good thing about Decon was they weren't like okay we're going to put you with a big name producer we're going to do this we're going to do that they just let you get on with it. Yes. And it gave us it gave us room to breathe. I mean, we we started it in 93 and ready to go. We hadn't written until 95. So we, we, we had two years of finding our feet. And but also, I mean, studio studios were an issue. I, I had a little set up at home, but it wasn't anything we could record stuff on. Then we set up a studio in Catford. Um, that we shared with a friend of ours who was renting the house. So he'd have three days a week, we'd have four days a week. He'd have four days a week, we'd have three days a week. And it was taking me two and a half hours to get there and two and a half hours to get back each day. So it was devotion to duty. Also, when we had no money, I was living on toast and baked beans at that point. So it was... It oh, my was, God, uh, not the water and cornflakes period. <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, the flowered up money was definitely long gone by that point. <laughs> yes, this is not good, is it? <laughs> but obviously, you know, I mean, things were changing and everyone was getting very excited. As you said, there was a lot of money about probably cocaine. But then when you when, you know, obviously most people in a band, it doesn't really get that far. But you kind of hit the sort of the jackpot really with ready, you know, ready to go. So we have a band that said yes. I think really that's you, the thing is you can get to a stage and you can either be really arsy about it and go no we believe in our our path we're we're 100 percent sure of what we're doing and like I'll stand and live and die by this and that sort of thing. But to be honest, we were talking to a lot of people who were saying you could try this, you could do this, and we're like well that's interesting and like we like your advice and we like the way you're. We like what you're saying to us. So when the Americans came to us and said, we'd like to remix Ready to Go, which initially was a piano house track, we were like, mm, yeah, all right, then. we'll give it a whirl. And i got to be honest, when they first sent me back, I went, oh, my God, I knew they'd do this to it. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but a week later, I was like, oh, no, it is, <laughs> it is really good. Well, we're just the band that said yes. They they offered us opportunities, and we grasped them with both hands. Do you want to go on tour with them people? Yes. Do you want to uh, get remixed by the Chemical Brothers? Yes. Do you want to all sorts of things like that? We just said yes. Like we'd love to do it. We'd like we started off as a as a band with a DAT backing, just with two keyboard players, pretty much miming and Saffron singing over the top. And when one of us had the idea of why don't we make it into more of a band and bring more guitars in. So then we brought in a percussion player and a bass player and a guitarist, Johnny Mayle again. And then we ended up with a drummer, like as a full blown thing with the electronics and the drums. And not a lot of people were doing that. I mean, I know the Happy Mondays were sort of having to go that way live, but they were still more of a live band than they were a, a dance act. Whereas we more straddled the we straddled sort of the heavier dance side and the rock side quite well. Yes, absolutely. And and obviously this was a time when there was ID magazine, Blitz, and obviously the face. Yeah. So oh you must have picked up on all that kind of happening scene and suddenly felt like you were part of it, really. Yeah. No, we, we, we sort of got swept up in... Actually, no, we weren't. <laughs> I'm lying there. <laughs> we, we were going out the clubs and we were hanging out with friends. Of, I mean, when you chemicals and saffron went out with carl from underworld and all this sort of thing so we were sort of hanging around in that scene but we were just not do we weren't we weren't breaking at all the first couple of singles had done virtually nothing the first one never really went past promo the second one got a release and got us on the tv 
but it was ready to go. That well, actually, the first time ready to go came out, it peaked at fifty one and died. So <laughs> why did why did you why did you put because it was bloke that put you put out the first single, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, well, bloke was this, bloke was supposed to be the second one, but the the first one was out of this world, which was the one that Saf sung on, which ended up on the first album as uh, out of the darkness, which we still do live actually. But uh, no, we. Um, yeah, sorry, I lost me th- lost me train there. <laughs> yes. No, I just wondered why you went for Bloke as your first single on that album then. Uh, because we didn't have anything else particularly ready, unfortunately. We had a load of stuff in the pipeline, but Decon were like, right, we need to get something out. And we're like, OK, well, let's go with Bloke. So we did the, did the couple of remixes of that ourselves, saved money and got it out. Yes. And then... There's always because because we're doing this doing this show for a while. Most bands have a five, five year narrative, mostly, um, if they're lucky. You know, they have that kind of you know eighteen months of honeymoon, then the single, and then that first album. And you know, in the indie world, it would have been a John Peel session and and you know playing yeah. all the little clubs around the the country. But you you know, obviously, it's a bit different when you hit kind of the jackpot first time and you have that tricky, you know, the well, cliche first... the second album. Our first Republic of gig, we only had three songs written, one of which was Bloke, Out of This World, and I can't even remember what the third one. I think it was one that never actually got used called Eyes sometimes. Our first gig was the Albert Hall. Which yes, <laughs> it's, it's not the Norwich Arts Centre, is it? It's No, it's no, it's not the UEA either. It's, um, uh, no, it was it was a black and white ball. We, we only got up, played the three songs, pretty much miming it, and it went off again. But um, Mick Jones was in the dressing room. Uh, Rusty Egan was in the dressing room. It was <laughs> it was picking up then. So after that, we we were doing the Cream tours. So we got sort of affiliated because Decon and Cream were very much arm in arm at the time. We ended up going around doing tours. So we'd be on tour with the Grid and uh, Justin Robertson and uh, Nick. I can't remember his name now. Uh, from way out west. So Decon actually put they they funded us well and put us out to be to be seen as a band rather than just try and do it through the releases, which was I think was a good thing to do. It eventually pushed us down that that band route. Yes. Which is ultimately we me and Johnny felt more comfortable doing anyway because we'd come from that. Yeah. But by because in sort of nineteen ninety seven we had Team Tony, New Labour. Things can only get better. It felt so optimistic. So when you brought the the second Don't, album out a year later, were you top of the pops was the day Tony Blair got in? Was it? Yeah, the first the first top of the pops for Ready to Go was the day that it was our. It, I've got to say it was probably our finest day in pop, as me and Johnny would like to say. <laughs> the day, the very day that New Labour got in, was the day we did top of the pops. <laughs> nice. That's a nice. Yeah. That's a nice memory, actually. Yeah, with Robbie Williams. <laughs> was he doing Angels at the time? I'm not sure what he was doing. No, I think it, it was before that. Right, because I we think ended, actually we ended up renting his. We 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 rented we rented our studio out to him for a little while actually <laughs> after he left. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he he I think he had released a few singles from that album and it was like it wasn't happening and it was like the history of people going solo after being in a boys band was not there was not good was it so yeah I. That that was sort of that was all that stuff came off the back of the stuff he'd written in the studio in our studio when we were on tour, I think. Yes, that was quite something. He, he was being managed by Tim Abbott, who was part of um, he was part of the um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, oh, lost my brain again. Creation. He used to work at Creation. He was managing Robbie for a while after he split. Oh, okay, my God. He was doing that period because I knew Tim from from uh, his brother he used to work for Heavenly, basically. Got it all. World. <laughs> yes. Well, I suppose creation had sort of also had been doing incredibly well, hadn't they? They'd had their zeitgeist moment. Well, they'd sort of been yeah. around in the eighties with with a lot of the indie stuff, which was glorious. But then they sort of hit the big time um, with Oasis. What was that? Good old Alan. We came we came across it later on. <laughs> Alan comes back into the story later. Does he? Yes, he does. Yeah. Excellent. This is good. So with your second album, there's a lot of money thrown at this. Producers, studios, the lot. Yeah. What, was 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 the pressure on? Oh yeah, very very much so. Um, if we'd have again, it was 
um, Decon were selling out to BMG at the time, and a large portion of their figures for the next year was to include a Republica album. So the pressure was put on us to complete said album very quickly, but we'd uh, already shed my original writing partner, Toddy, Andrew Todd, who decided that he did once we ended up touring the States for like 60 dates and all this sort of thing, he decided he didn't want to go on the road anymore. He just wanted to stay in the studio and write music and we could go out and perform it for him, which um, <coughs> led to him leaving. Because oh, so, Brian, so, Brian Wilson did something quite similar, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He decided he was staying at home and decided he wanted to write it all. So... And we're like, well, no, you either you're either on for the full haul or <coughs> or you go. <laughs> was that so a big I, decision? Because obviously he was one of the original. It was awful, and the tra- the thing was, I went up to the management. I I didn't really have an inkling of this. It would have been it, it, there'd always been friction between him and Saffron. <coughs> Excuse me, I haven't got COVID. No, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> I better not do. I just got back from Tenerife. Um, but there'd always been friction between him and Saffron. It ended up one day I went into the management offices and they said, right, Saffron's been in and said she can't work with, jo- with Toddy anymore. Uh, Johnny's backing her up. What are you going to do? Who are you going with? God, no pressure then. No. It was <laughs> just like, oh, okay. Um, well. Had you expected that, by the way? No. I hadn't seen it. Come. I knew there was friction. There was a lot of friction, but they kept patching it up and then falling out and patching it up. So yeah, I should have seen it coming, but um, no, I was it was it was pretty much fate accompli by the time I had to make a decision. Yeah. I had the I went with my original writing partner. Yes. So, uh, we fell out very badly. <laughs> God, he must have. Did he feel very, betrayed? Yeah, he did feel very, very betrayed. But he couldn't see what he'd done to to make everyone else take that decision. He wouldn't accept that. Uh, he would have had to move his position, and he was just—he was—he was from Dagenham. He was a helium cockney, and he was very stubborn and very thick in his ways. So, um, yeah, we—we've spoken once or twice since, and never pleasant words. So, mm. <laughs> one of my big life regrets, to be honest. I, I've got to be honest. I—I I, I did treat him badly, but I, at the point, at, at that point, I just didn't really have a choice. Yes. It would was, by the way, would band therapy have helped at this stage, or was it just gone? Uh, no, no, we couldn't have gotten the 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 situation between him and Saffron had got beyond the pale. It couldn't be resurrected. I think we all knew that, really. Yes, my God, she was the face, wasn't she? She was. <laughs> so we went into doing a second album, trying not to use songs we'd half written with him and. Not really, and he'd worked. I mean, his his history to the point when I started working with him was thirteen years of engineering at CBS Studios, working with Barbara Streisand and people like that. So he'd he he knew what he was doing in a studio, and it was it was then a mantle that I had to adopt to get us up and writing again. And then from that point onwards, I was happy to leave. We got Clive. Well, we started with Clive Langer. Again, um, having tried a few other people. I'm amazed you never worked with Tim Palmer. Strangely enough, I'm amazed because he just moves in exactly the same circles that we do. Our manager, Dave James, who was um, uh, he was the lead singer of Modern Romance. But, um, he uh, has always looked after Jar Wobble, John Reynolds, um, and Tim Palmer has always been... There's always worked with John Reynolds, and for some reason we never ended up with him. Gareth Jones as well, we actually had meetings with at one point. That would have been a very interesting combination, but unfortunately, um, time-wise, that couldn't happen, I think. Yeah. I was going... A couple of people who are going, oh, the demos sound fine, let them do it themselves. It was just like, okay, you just don't want to do it. <laughs> so, I, well, at my suggestion, we asked Clive, because... Having worked with him on weekend, I knew he was capable of in the pop sense. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he was a little out of his depth with us as well, actually, because he, he didn't really get the dance side of it. Well, I was going to say, was he a little bit old school? Because, like, Tim would have been kind of... Because I did sort of do an interview with Tim, and, and he was a bit like... 
you know, Clive Clive needed some younger people who had the the new you know the ears for what was happening, whereas he sounded a little bit like things were. I don't know. He was a bit of an old soak, really. Yeah. Oh yeah, he loved to drink. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of drinking on that album. I tell you. But the, the, we realised after a while because we were working with. Um, uh, Alan Win Stanley, his partner at the time, who's a great engineer, but he's he's also very stage in his ways and was at the time. So eventually we did jump ship and a lot of the stuff got redone with um, Ian Stanley and Andy Gray. Yes. And yeah. So that was that was that was all done at our place and strong room. It was um yeah, that was uh, that was a, a that was nice to be back in the thick of it again because Andy Gray was so heavily into the technology of it and really coming from our angle. And Ian Stanley is just a fantastic producer. It's He really just, he works his guts out, that guy. He will go till six in the morning without any problem and just keep going and pursuing and pursuing his vision. He's amazing. Yes. Stephen Street said no. He sort of finished at five. He didn't want to work evenings. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you got to get a cab back from Hoxton at half past four in the morning, back to Windsor is no fun. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, actually. And did you get that sense? Because obviously at that stage, people won't even know what I'm talking about. But we were sort of looking at the end of the decade and the millennium bug. And the party had changed quite a bit, hadn't it? I sort of... You know, I mean, you know, the music industry, thing, things were changing, you know, people were yeah. sort of dropping yeah. off and, and there was definitely a sense of something else happening, a bit, a bit like when we were celebrating the new year and new decade only 11 months ago. Little did we know. But, yeah. you know, there is that sense of change, isn't there? A bit like, you know, when you look at those producers, you know, we grew up to that world of, you know, there was Mickey Most, everything that Mickey Most was on yeah. was going to be gold or, you know, Phil right. Spector. Yeah. But then you realise actually they they... Like a lot of people, it's like, well, what happened to Mickey Mouse? Didn't he just have the minus touch? It's like, mm, I don't know, really. But he didn't. He wouldn't have understood what was coming next, would he? No, he went off the boil, I'd have thought. Yes. But, uh, yeah, at, at that time, it was very much a state of flux. It was There was no particular direction for it. it, it I mean, pop had made its... It's it very much... It, it just started putting its stamp on things again, hadn't it, by the end of the 90s? Yes. The successful acts were very much your, um, your little, not your well, little mixes, obviously a lot later, but your Atomic Kittens and those sort of things were the people who were making the headlines. It wasn't the indie acts at all. Yeah. But, but, the, the but then did you see that documentary with Jimmy Iovine and all that world that was kind of hardcore rap, you know, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Do Dr. Dre and Marilyn Manson and, and there was that whole new scene coming on. <laughs> I bought weed from Dr. Dre once, but you can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's quite good, actually. Hopefully. I know. My kids are really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, excellent. Yeah, so yeah. how did you cope when, you know, the turn of the decade? Uh, well, we, we were gone by then, 1999. Uh, our last gig was with, uh, right said Fred, at York University at Student Ball. Yeah. And that was it. Uh, 1999, we um, basically the record company had changed so much. We were now on to, uh, Decon was gone. We were just at the mercy of BMG. And we kept going into BMG with new demos. And we'd have a different A&R &R man every time we went in there. And we couldn't get a straight answer. And they wouldn't say whether they'd keep us. They wouldn't let us go. We had other, records com other record companies interested off the back of the demos. But BMG ultimately decided that, no, we're going to bury them. My so God. they wouldn't let us go. So the only way we could get out of the deal was to split up. And we thought at the time that it would be better. We, me and Johnny wanted to go off and be writers and just do this and do stuff. We thought Saf had a better chance of on her own if she went out on her own and got other nameless, faceless people behind her and she was the sole focus of the thing. We thought that was the best way forward. Yes. But uh, ultimately it wasn't. We We worked with a few people and... The industry was the, the face of the industry was changing rapidly. It was really quite shocking, actually. Yeah. But then, what happens to you? You know, you as the, as the sort of musician, artist, producer, had a studio. I mean, how do you sort I of pick working it? with Liam again? <laughs> uh, Liam had uh, cleaned himself up a lot. He, he 
done time in jail, I think, and had been to rehab and cleaned himself up. And basically, Alan McGee rang me and said, would I be interested in working with Liam again? He's got songs, but he needs somebody to do them with. Um, I said, well, I'll have a meeting. And we'll have a go. But I'm not. I, it didn't end up very well last time. <laughs> So he came down to Windsor to my little loft studio, as it was at the time, and we started working Greedy Soul, which is um, good fun. It was it was some of his better work, some of my better work, because I was just it was just me at the controls, and I was just able to do what I wanted to do. Really, I wasn't sort of working with anyone else. Liam was quite happy to let me get on with what I wanted to do, and I thought he was coming up with some of the best lyrics and deliveries that I'd heard in out of him in donkey's years and was he looking kind of not looking good but was he lo- kind of looking sharp as in was, was... Yeah. no he was he was he, he was back on fall i mean he was drinking an awful lot of cider but he was staying off the hard drugs so he was he was back and he had a good work ethic and he wanted to do it this time he, he was it was i think before it was all about liam and the management the management always wanted to be pop stars yes the day and um so liam always felt sort of it was him and them whereas this was just liam so and did it also feel like you had been given a second chance at this gig and not to blow this one it did but i'm (laughs) yeah but it does get blown (laughs) so we got we uh it got to the stage i think alan had some 12 inches pressed up on the first single uh, you got Jax Kuna to do a great remix of it. It was really good. And it was all going to go ahead. And we were we probably eight songs into working on the album, not finally mixed, just written. And for a reason totally nothing to do with the band, um, we ended up getting thrown off pop tones because of someone's violent nature who was basically Terry, the manager from Flowered Up, one of the management team from Flowered Up was looking after us. He'd, he'd sorted out the thing with Alan McGee at Pop Tones, but then he fell out with Alan. He fell out with somebody at the label over a DJing tour that Alan was doing in the states. He was supposed to go with him, and he basically beat the shit out of the bloke. And we were dropped the next day. The entire band got dropped. Nothing to do with us. Alan just said, I won't have that anywhere near my company. It just can't happen. Sorry, lads, but bye. It's not you, it's your management. Well, there you go. Yeah, so we, uh, I mean, I was, uh, we'd started doing gigs. We supported Primal Scream at the Astoria. Um, we played at Alan's um, thing in Notting Hill, the Notting Hill Arts Club. We'd done quite a few things like that. And um, we were fo- like, we found ourselves without a label. Without a management, just I was just having to do everything because Liam was never capable of organising anything. Yes, and um, did, and did you kind of uh, did you appreciate the kind of the reason behind that decision? I, yeah, I totally got it. I mean, I, I'm not that sort of I'm not a thug by any stretch of the imagination. I'm the one who runs and hides. So yeah, once I was livid, and I, obviously the guy was sacked on the spot, but it was just it, um, no, it it just never recovered from that. We had we had a couple of uh, we had shovel from M people and natural life was on percussion. We had Ed Ball who used to be on creation as well. He oh, was on yeah. both. We had Johnny Malin on guitar, uh, me on keyboards and backing, and Liam on vocals. But pretty soon Ed and Shovel went because um, they could see the way it was going, and Liam was starting to get back into stuff as well. And then we got an idiot bass player in who was just like just 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 a horrible little thug who started stealing things and it was just like do you know what I'm ten years ago I had enough of this I certainly don't need it now. Oh God, that's horrible. Yes. So off again. <laughs> and was that kind of? Did you sort of feel looking back that was kind of where Liam never recovers again? Uh, yeah. Well, again, there's there's a repeat. There's still a repeat performance. So, re, so this is 2001 by this point, I think. 2005, um, I'm getting applied a bit of pressure to do a flared up reunion thing. Um, the, this guy who he was um, he owned Turnmills, the club in London, and he was um, 
putting on a festival on Clapham Common and he wanted, he, the Mondays were headlining, he wanted us on the bill, the farm, all that sort of thing. So he actually put some money into getting us all back in a room, talking, rehearsing, working again, all the original lineup. So me, Liam, Joe, Andy, John, the original drummer, all back in a room rehearsing again. And it was well, it, it it was hard work on because because I'd been because I'd spent all the years touring and working and recording ever since that I knew what I was doing, but it was just like dragging it up by the bootstraps to get everyone rehearsed and together and in the right place and it all happening and being something you could put on display again it was really hard work. But yeah. we started. Getting there. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this time Joe was in a worse state than anybody living in a hostel. Um, uh, just like not in a good place. Um, I lent him a, I lent him a Fender Strat that I'd managed to hang on for years from Republica. He left it on a bus. Um, <clears throat> he didn't come to some rehearsals. So when we started doing gigs, we did about three gigs. Uh, I know we did the, the Boston Arms in um, Tufnell Park. Uh, I think we did Coco as well, supporting somebody else. But then we did this big gig in Clapham Common, and um, Joe basically overdosed. So instead of me getting to see the farm and the Happy Mondays and all that sort of thing, I ended up with him and his girlfriend in Tooting Beck Hospital with him having stomach pumped, which was basically the last fucking <laughs> straw. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's you not... You can't go beyond that. It, it, it's just that like, my life is just too short to do all this crap. And it was it was my big day. I got all my friends up and all this sort of thing, and I didn't get to see them after the gig because Joe just nicked too much drugs or where I don't know what it was. Yes. But just It was just, I just can't do flowered up anymore and walked. And that was it. It was probably... Yeah. Sometimes you need to have the kind of extreme to make yourself think. Yeah, it was a moment of clarity. It was just like, this is just like, like much as much as you love these guys and much as we make great music when we were together, you can't have this in your life. No. What was their yeah. family? What was their family like? Did you ever meet or know anything about their parents? Uh, uh, Joe and Liam, uh, lovely Irish mother, uh, five kids. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they they didn't have the best up. They all grew up on the Regent's Park estate in Camden anyway. So they all come from around that neck of the woods in Summers Town. And it, 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 back in the late 80s, early 90s, it was rough. It was bloody rough. And I, I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have been with these guys, I wouldn't have even gone in the estates. It was, but, but it was, for the, but once you got in with them, there was an immense sense of family and an immense sense of brotherhood. But they had, I mean, Liam, had, like they've all, they'd all grown up ducking and diving, like little market stalls selling bootlegs, all that sort of thing, is where they came from. Driving meat vans around London. I mean, you go, like, two of the guys that are still left, Andy and Andy and John, both drive London cabs these days. So they they haven't moved on really. Yeah. As they said, <laughs> could have been a contender, but yeah. then. But so well, at least on your sort of afternoon to watch all these great bands or not, in your case, you were just in A&E. Um, yep. Yes. So then and then how did Republica then sort of come back together? Well, we uh, we tried doing a few. Me and Johnny did a few little things, working with a few other people and doing a bit of writing for acts as well that never really got off the ground. And in 2009, um, we were doing... Johnny and I were doing a band, well, it's his band, called Contramundum. We were just, um, we've written a lot of songs and we went out on tour, very strange, with a bloke called William Control. I don't know why they picked us to go on tour with them. It was the strangest experience. He was like a, like a real industrial goth type. <laughs> we really weren't. <laughs> We didn't even tell him we were in Republica the entire tour. We told him on the last night, oh, God, man, they were my favourite band in the 90s. <laughs> it was uh, a very strange thing. But um, one of the the last gig that we did uh, was our own gig um, in Windsor. So it was a bit of a home. It, it was at the Working Men's Club in Windsor. 
But we sold out 200 tickets for it just for this little local band thing we had going. And we thought, all right, let's get Saffron down. And uh, we'll do Drop Dead and Ready to Go. We'll just, like, that'll be it and be job done. It'll just get more people down. We'll we'll get bums on seats if we get her involved. So that was sort of how it started again. Yes. She came down, sung those two, and then we just sort of kept in touch and said, well, with Saffron, we had to make her think it was her idea, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, heard that before. Someone, yeah. You, you, oh God, it actually it was Tim Palmer. He 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 worked with people like Tricky, and he said you had to sort of feed him the idea, and then you realised that next day he would come in with this idea. Yeah, you think, yeah. yeah, revisionist history is something that Saffron excels at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, no, we it it sort of trickled along for a couple of months, sort of shall we, shan't we, and then eventually. Um, we'd still stayed in touch with the management that we'd had all those years. In fact, they'd they'd still been our management, mine, mine and Johnny's management all the way through, so if I'm going with other people. But we, um, they booked us a gig. So we're like, okay, let's let's do it. And uh, got the old drummer back again, Pete Riley, who um, had a, had recovered from a very bad couple of years with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. <laughs> So he wasn't really up. So he lasted a couple of gigs, but he wasn't up for any diva behaviour from her. So he left and uh, he didn't really want the grief of driving in and out of London because he'd moved out of town. So then we got Connor Lawrence in, our, uh, who was somebody that I worked with. He was 17 when we found him. And uh, he's been with us ever since. <laughs> so that means, does that mean the band is like a, a, a steady relationship? Do you all sort of know where you are and, and how to sort of cope with each other. Yeah, we do. Yeah, well, we, we these days, to be honest, we what we tended to do the past few years, I mean, obviously the past 18 months has been a little bit different, but, um, well, not 18 months, but the past year. Um, in terms of writing, we've been getting together and we, we'd hire a cottage down in Cornwall. I'd take a studio's worth of kit down there and we'd start putting things together. So we we do a week in a in a in a rented cottage and start writing that way. And we have actually got an album that's done and finished, but um, which is finished not this August, the August before, but uh, has yet to see the light of day at the moment because of the uh, the, the original album reissue. Yeah, we're concentrating on the we've been concentrating on the live stuff really in Re in Republic of Sense for the past few years now. We've been doing sort of 20, 30 gigs a year up until this year. And well, really enjoying it. And like, go, we, we did, we've done odd little things like going on tour with Card and Ned's Atomic Dustbin. Uh, we supported um, Boomtown Rats around the UK. Um, things like that. We've done the odd little headline-y sort of thing. But generally we've been doing festivals and and that sort of thing. Does it feel like the band have got more respect from a wider audience now? Because there's nothing like the passing of time for people to suddenly... Like I said at the beginning, you know, when I first saw, or not saw, but, you know, heard Depeche Mode, I'd slightly went, mm, no, yeah. <laughs> new romantics, I can't possibly yes. like them. And then you think, actually... Well, when personal Jesus comes along, everybody loves them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dear old Johnny Cash. Um, yeah. Having said, I mean, part of the thing is that we, we have struggled a little sometimes with the smaller festivals because you'll find that they've sat, the, the audience has sat through a day of tribute acts. Oh. So you'll find yourself essentially with only sort of sort of three hits that people would know in our set going on after Queen or going on after No Oasis or <laughs> this sort of thing. So sometimes that can get a little disheartening. I've got to say, because you're going on trying to play your best stuff, but no one's heard it. Whereas the person who's been on before you might have had a has had a, an hour set of absolutely run to the gundled hits written by somebody else. Yes. So you have it, it's it's a yeah it's it's not a bitter thing. It, it, sometimes it's just difficult, especially when you're doing Sunday night. It's drizzling, and you're going on after a somebody representing a massive act. It still can be difficult out there, even for a band that's been around twenty-five plus years. With the real, with the with the actual members. Yeah, yeah. 
with the real people. With it's, the real deal. Because it was yeah. cherry, cause dear old Cherry Red Records, who we love. I mean, they we brought do. out your compilation. I hope, hope you love them. Um, oh, we do, yeah. No, they're, they're very nice people. We'd like them to put the other album out if we're interested. <laughs> yes. And was that quite... Um, did that feel like a sense of completion, being able to put out this? It was a triple CD, wasn't it? It was nice to get everything together that I've had on CDs floating around in the loft for years, I tell you that. It was uh, getting everything in one place was was quite the mission. But uh, no, it, it felt like a good underlining of it all and just a, like a, it was a nice thing to do just to put it all in one place and package it up. Yes. So with, your, yeah. with the new album that you've got waiting mm. in the wings, um, how did, did, that, did that come together quite sort of smoothly? Oh, yeah, over 17 years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, um, a lot of it was, uh, I, I mean, a lot of it's been, Johnny would come down to me for a day or two, we write the basics, I'd spend a week doing the rest of the thing, Johnny would come into overdubs. So it, was a, it was a very long process, but it was, we just fitted it in wherever we could. I mean, I... I I work five days a week these days. I'm a painter and decorator. I don't, <laughs> I don't spend all day in the studio, unfortunately, much as I'd love to. I've got to pay the bills. Yes. So um, Saffron works. She looks after um, sort of fifty-year-olds' down patients at the moment. Uh, we, we've all got our own little things going. So um, it, it's t- it took quite a while to get it together, and then. I'm ultimately very pedantic, and because I ended up producing and mixing it, I got very, very nitpicky about it and spent another year dicking around with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Still, that was still over 18 months ago that I stopped dicking around with it. So, uh, and what well, label? And, and what label will put it out? Um, at the moment, we don't have one. So uh, we've. We've talked to a couple of people, but it's just then things got in the way and we lost track of the, it. It's we'd like somebody that would be able to give it a bit of a push rather than somebody who'll just stick it. If you want to just stick it out, we can stick it on Bandcamp any day of the week and rely on social media to try and shift a few hundred copies. But we think it deserves a little bit more than that. So we're we're still holding out for somebody that might put a bit of dosh behind it really yeah and with your you know experience of being in the music world for decades does it still boggle and baffle you with this sort of the world of producing ownership of music where the hell does all the money go and that kind of side of it um i think these days it's a lot more reasonable um i, I mean I, if you want to get involved with the major label these days it's a 360 deal they want a slice of everything including your underwear it's just not it's nothing I'd really entertain, but I think in the in the indie and cottage industry world of it, it's very very buoyant. Um, the price of actually doing anything has come right down. There's so many more people out there just doing their thing. I mean, these days I'm I spend most of my time these days in my spare time. I'm working with a band called The Friction. I've just been mixing and mastering for them. Uh, I work with a band called EMT. I've produced and mixed their first album. We're one song away from the end of the second album. Uh, I'm also in another band called Tin Gun, who includes uh, a couple of people from other, another band called Sign Star and Tenek. So we've, we've got other projects on the go on the side, all of us really. Yeah. Working with some, some Irish guys. Uh, he's got an album coming out with them at some point where he's been writing and producing with them. Yeah. So we're not, I'm not idle, let's put it that way. I'm also working with a very good rapper as well. I'm, I'm now delving into the world of hip-hop at the age of 55 and trying to get them, <laughs> trying to get your head around like the reference tracks that this 22-year-old rapper comes with. In, comes in with his, uh, I love it. It's It's challenging. Every day's a learning day, and I've learned so much more doing it. So, um, yeah, just being a beast of the studio for me these days is fantastic. And if I can get out and do gigs, that's that's all the better. I love getting away for the weekend, seeing the boys, going out for a great meal, staying in a hotel, doing yeah. a fantastic gig in the middle of nowhere. It's great. I still love it. Yeah, because it seemed because you have played with so many different people, you know. Because there was the the drummer from Bow Wow Well, you played with him as well, didn't you, David? Yeah, Dave was our original. Dave Bob Ross was our original Republican drummer. He was the first one. Um, 
he was unfortunately he uh, we sort of fell out with him <laughs> uh he wanted to get back to sign on one day when we were in copenhagen and uh, he got the ump so uh, we all fell out yes and played for us again then we got pete riley who played with us to the end of sort of republica mark one yeah he, uh, fantastic he's gone on to do he played with um keith emerson for a number of years before Keith's untimely death. Oh my God, that's horrendous. Yes. Yeah, he's very, he, he's very technical and very much of that ilk. He he can really hold his own with anybody in the world, I'd have said, Pete Riley. Amazing drummer. I mean, as, as quite a lot of people said, as long as you've got a good drummer, you've basically got a good band. Yep, yeah, that's why we've got Connor Lawrence now. He is now 26, but absolutely fantastic and also doing very well as a producer and mixer up in Manchester as well. So nice one. So look, well, so if you could have you could have said something to an eighteen year old self starting out, because actually you've you've had, you know, these different careers and what not career not you did these different chapters and journeys with different bands. I mean, so it's quite interesting. I mean what would if there was anything you could have said to your eighteen year old self starting out, I just wonder what that might have been. Listen. Just listen to what people have got to say. And try and take advice where it's well meant. It's uh, especially if you're that young and trying to make your way in an industry full of sharks. You really keep your wits about you, but like listen to people and weigh it all up. That was what I would say. And if it's if it's something you think is valid worth doing, say yes. And if it's something that you think is not, say no. I think there's things I should have said no to, and I think there's things earlier on that I should definitely have said yes to. Yes. That's always tricky, isn't it? But you know, with that's that's with twenty twenty hindsight, it really is. You've got to make those own mistakes yourself, unfortunately. And I, I've made a few of them. Yes. And luckily, I've had some upsides too. Well, these are always good. The upsides, aren't they? And did you? I mean, just on a bit of a down, I suppose. I mean, having you know the two brothers die quite close yeah. to each other. Did that? I mean, how did that make you kind of feel when you were sort of trying to keep sort of republica going in your own career um well that was it was that was like mid that, there was no republica at that point so um there was it was more a sadness that they'd ended up that way it was uh i mean with liam it was we're still not sure why he died we know how he died we're not too sure why and with joe it was just the result of so many years of abuse Yes. But um, he just lay down one night and didn't wake up. So, I don't know. It was, it, I, I mean, what do you say? It's, it, it happens. But, it, but they, I mean, not, it, luckily, it was never a case of there, but for the grace of God, go I. I. I was never of that mindset that wanted to go anywhere near the, the dark side that they went. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview. You thought it would never finish. Anyway, brilliant stuff. I am slightly biased, but I still thought it was a great interview. That was me in conversation with Tim Dorney to find out more about life, love, poetry, basically life in music, including Flowered Up. We love them. And also Republica. Anyway, this has been David East of the C86 Show. Hopefully I'm not repeating myself. I know, you worry about your brain after a while, dementia, all that sort of stuff. But if you do want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86show, it's all good. And also, all these shows have been archived. You can find those on Spotify, iTunes and Podbean. It's true. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.